Chapter 39, The Dream. Three weeks passed away in a most agreeable manner, and Richard frequently expressed his gratitude to Armstrong for the pleasure he had procured him by this visit. The more he saw of Count Alteroni's daughter, the more he was compelled to admire her personal and mental qualifications. But he felt somewhat annoyed when he discovered that Captain Smilax Dapper was paying his addresses to her, for he was interested in so charming a young lady and would have regretted to see her throw herself away on such a coxcomb. He did not, however, find that Isabella gave the captain any encouragement. On the contrary, he had frequently seen an erratic smile of contempt upon her lips when the military aspirant to her hand uttered an absurdity or indulged in an air of affectation. By the constant and unvaried respect, and the absence of all familiarity on the part of Dapper towards the lovely Italian, Markham also argued that he had not as yet declared his sentiments, because had he been a favored suitor, the truth would have betrayed itself in some trifling manner or another. Moreover, as Isabella conducted, her, conducted herself in only just the same friendly way towards Captain Dapper as she manifested toward her father's other guests, Richard saw no reason to believe that his passion was reciprocal. Markham was thrown much in the Signora's society during his visit at her father's house. He soon perceived that she preferred a conversation upon edifying and intellectual subjects to the frivolous chit-chat of Sir Cherry Bounce and Captain Dapper, and he frequently found himself carrying on a lengthened discourse upon music, poetry, painting, and Italian literature, while the others were amusing themselves in the billiard or smoking rooms. But Isabella was no blue stocking. She was full of vivacity and life, and her conversation was sprightly and agreeable, even when turning upon those serious subjects. In a few days after Richard's arrival, it was always he who turned the leaves of Isabella's music book, because Captain Dapper didn't know when. She always took his arm when they walked around the shrubbery and garden after breakfast, because Captain Dapper was constantly leaving her to play Sir Cherry some trick. And somehow or another, at mealtimes, Richard and Isabella were invariably seated next to each other. Oh, I hope this turns out well. I will be so frustrated if it doesn't. Such was the state of things at the expiration of three weeks, to which extent, although contrary to the original proposal of Armstrong, the visit had already extended, and Captain Smilnax Dapper more than once fancied that he saw a rival in Richard Markham. At length, he determined to communicate his suspicions to his friend Sir Cherry Bounce, a resolution which he carried into effect in the following manner. "'Cherry, my dear fellow,' he said one morning, taking the effeminate young baronet with him into the garden, up the gravel walks of which he walked in a very excited state. "'Cherry, my dear fellow, I have something upon my mind. Strike me, and I wish to unburden myself to you.' "'Do you, Silmax? Smilax, I can never say his name right. Do you, Smilax, what can you possibly, what can possibly be the matter, demanded the youth, turning pale. Is it very terrible? Because if it is, I had better call the Count, and he will bring his blunderbuss. <laughs> so, <laughs> he immediately jumps to, maybe we should have the Count bring a weapon. <laughs> Strike me an idiot, Cherry. <laughs> If you ain't a fool with your counts and blunderbusses. Now listen to me. I love Isabella and have been doing the agreeable to her. Oh, my soul, I never could see it. I dare say not. Strike me if I didn't keep it so precious, snug, and quiet. However, I love the girl. And curse me if I don't have her too. That's more. She shall be Mrs. Smilax Dapper as sure as she was born. And I hope the mother of a whole regiment of little Smilaxes. <laughs> oh, he's getting a little out of himself, isn't he? And then, Cherry, you shall stay a month or six weeks, with, six weeks with us at a time and hold the little ones on your knee and shall everything will go on comfortably and smooth. Oh, very smooth, cried Sir Cherry Bounce, making a slight grimace at the pleasing prospect of holding the little dappers upon his knees. <laughs> And I suppose I am not presumptuous in aspiring to the hand of Isabella. My father is a peer, and my uncle is a peer, and I have three thousand a year of my own besides expectations. Strike me if I'm a man to be sneezed at. Who's, who thinks of sneezing at you? <laughs> I don't know exactly, and then I am not such a very bad-looking fellow either. You are not ugly, Cherry. You are not. That is, not particularly ugly, although you have got pink eyes and white lashes and a pug nose, and I'm more athletic. Strike me. I'm sure I don't dispute what you say. Well, then, acknowledging all this, proceeding, proceeded the captain, how should I treat a fellow who endeavors to cut me out? Challenge him to fight with sword and pistol, answered Sir Cherry. But who is it? 
that upstart fellow Markham who was brought here by that odious Republican, seditious, disloyal scoundrel Armstrong, and who talks all day about poetry and music and who knows what. However, can't say I admire that plan of yours, continued the captain. Swords and pistols, you know, are so very dangerous and... <laughs> And what else? Why, you're a fool, Cherry. I thought you would have hit upon some plan to enable me to secure the prize. Well then, supposing we carry the girl off to Woochester, for instance. <laughs> now it's like, hmm, so pistols won't work. Let's just kidnap her. Well, to deuce take it, Rochester, my regiment is quartered at Chatham. Well, to Canterbury, then? Yes, that will do. Strike me blind if it won't, said the captain. But if I could only get rid of this Markham somehow or another, I should prefer it. The fellow, Captain Smilax, dapper stopped short, for at that moment, as he and his companion were turning the angle of the summer house, they ran against Richard Markham. It wasn't me, it wasn't me who spoke, said Sir Cherry Bounce. <laughs> and having uttered these words, he very fairly took to his heels, leaving his friend, the captain, to settle matters as he might. <laughs> Who is taking an, a most unwarranted liberty with my name, demanded Richard, walking straight up to Captain Smilax, dapper. I certainly made an observation, answered the captain, turning pale, and I do not hesitate to say, sir, what, sir? Why, sir, that I feel, sir, that strike me, sir. Yes, sir, I shall strike you, very coolly answered Markham, and that will teach you not to speak lightly of one who is a comparative stranger to you on another occasion. As he uttered these words, he seized the captain by the collar and gave him a couple boxes on the ears. Dapper endeavored to pluck up a spirit and resist, but the ceremony was performed before he could release himself from his assailant's crutches, and he then returned to the house, muttering threats of vengeance. <laughs> Richard. Not that I blame Richard, but it seems like everything always goes bad for him. That same afternoon, Markham took leave of his friends. On his return home, he found his dwelling more lonely and cheerless than ever. He felt that he was isolated in the world, and his heart seemed to be pierced with a red-hot iron when the remembrance of all his wrongs returned to his imagination. Oh, if we would but study the alphabet of fate and remember that each leaf which falls, each flower that dies, is but the emblem of man's kindred doom, how much of the coldness, coldness and selfishness, the viciousness of life would be swept away, and earth would be but a proof sheet of heaven's fairer volume. With errors and imperfections, it is true, but still susceptible of correction and amendment, ere its pages be unfolded before the high chancery of heaven. Spring now asserted its tranquil reign once more, and May strewed the earth with flowers and covered the trees with foliage. One evening Richard sat in his library reading until a very late hour. Night came and found him at his studies, and the morning dawned ere he thought of retiring to slumber. He hastened to his bedroom with the intention of seeking his couch, but he felt no inclination to sleep. He walked up to the window, drew aside the curtain, and gazed forth into the open air. The partial obscurity seemed to hang like a dusky veil against the windows, but by degrees the darkness yielded to the gray light of dawn. He glanced in the direction of the hill upon the summit of which stood the two trees, and he thought of his brother. He wondered for the thousandth time whether that appointment would, eventually, would be eventually kept, and why Eugene came not to revisit the home of his birth. He was in the midst of cogitations like these when his eyes were suddenly struck by an object which seemed to be moving between the trees upon the top of the hill. <gasps> Someone's at the trees. I wonder if it's his brother. A superstitious fear seized upon Richard's mind. In the first moment of his surprise, he imagined that the apparition of his brother had been led back to the trysting place by those leafy banners that proclaimed the covenant of the heart. But he speedily divested himself of that momentary alarm and smiled at his folly in believing it to be extraordinary that anyone should visit the hill at that very hour. The object was still there. It was a human being. And as the morning gradually grew brighter, he was unable to distinguish that it was a man. I wonder if it is! The opt okay, but at that was the hour at which laborers went to their daily toils. Still, why should one of those peasants linger upon the top of the hill to reach which he must have gone out of his way? Markham felt an indescribable curiosity to repair to the hill, but he was ashamed to yield to the superstitious impulse under the influence of which he still more or less labored, and the sudden disappearance of the object of his anxiety from time from the hill confirmed him in his resolution to remain in his chamber. He accordingly closed the blind and retired to the couch where he shortly sank into a deep slumber. Oh, I'm so sure it was his brother. We could have found out more. Richard, come on, buddy. Markham was now plunged into the aerial world of dreams. First he saw himself walking by the side of Isabella in a cool and shady grove where the birds were singing cheerily in the trees and it seemed to him that there reigned a certain understanding between himself and his fair companion which allowed him to indulge in the most delightful and tender hopes. He pressed her hand. She returned the token of affection and love. Suddenly, this scene was rudely interrupted. 
From a deep recess in the grove appeared a wretch covered with rags, dirty and revolting in appearance, with matted hair, parched and cracked lips, wild and ferocious eyes, and a demonic expression of countenance. Isabella screamed. The wretch advanced, grasped Richard's hand, gave utterance to a horrible laugh, and claimed his friendship, the friendship of Newgate. It seemed to Richard that he made a desperate effort to withdraw his hand from that rude grasp, and the attempt instantly awoke him. He opened his eyes, but the horror experienced in his dream was now prolonged, for a human countenance was bending over him. It was not, however, the distorted, hideous, and fearful one which he had seen in his vision, but a counten handsome countenance, though very pale, and whose features were instantly familiar to him. "'Eugene, my brother, Eugene!' said Richard, and he stretched out his arms to embrace him, whom he thus adjured. But scarcely had his eyes opened upon that countenance when it was instantly withdrawn, and Richard remained for a few moments in his bed, deprived of all power of motion, and the endeavoring to assure him whether he was awake or in a vision. "'Who knows? Oh, man!' A sudden impulse roused him from his lethargy, and he sprang from his couch, rushed toward the door, and called aloud for his brother. The door was closed when he reached it, and no trace seemed to denote that any visitor had been in that chamber. He threw on a dressing gown, hurried downstairs, and found all the doors fast closed and locked as usual at that hour. He opened the front door and looked forth, but no one was to be seen. Bewildered and alarmed, he returned to his bedchamber and once more sought his couch. He again fell asleep in the midst of numerous and conflicting conjectures relative to the incident which had just occurred, and when he awoke two hours afterward, he was fain to persuade himself that it was all a dream. He dressed himself and walked towards the hill. On his arrival at the top, he instinctively cast his eyes upon the name and date carved in the bark of his brother's tree. But how great was his surprise, how ineffable his joy, when he beheld fresh traces of the same hand imprinted on that tree, beneath the former memento, and still fresh and green, as if they had only been engraved a few hours, were the words, Eugene, May 17th, 1838. It was Eugene! He was there! It was, th it was then no dream, exclaimed Richard. He threw himself upon the seat between the two trees and wept abundantly. So we know Eugene was at the trees, but did he actually come into the house? And if he did, why didn't he stay? And why didn't he say anything to Richard? Ugh. Okay, see you for the next chapter. Um.